Welcome. Today we shall begin our discussion of cosmology, contemporary cosmology. As I said at the end of the last lecture, I have divided this discussion into six lectures and arranged them in some logical order. Today we shall begin more or less at the beginning with the discovery of the expansion of our universe in the 1920s, almost a hundred years ago. I shall also discuss how when the universe was three minutes old, the elements, the lighter elements, were synthesized. Our story begins in November 1915, when Einstein published his general theory of relativity. Within two years after that, Einstein turned to a study of the universe using his newly discovered theory. There was a difficulty in discussing the universe as a whole in Newtonian theory if the universe happened to be infinite. But there is no such problem in general relativity and, and so Einstein embarked on a study of the universe, the dynamics of the universe, using his new theory of gravity. In 1917, Einstein, like most people, believed that the universe must be static. Certainly there was no observational evidence otherwise. Well, if the universe had just mass, and if the masses interacted due to mutual gravity, then surely, if anything, the universe must contract due to self-gravity. And since this wasn't observed, Einstein tried to create a static universe by introducing in a very, very artificial manner a constant term into his beautiful theory of relativity. A co small constant lambda of a suitable sign such that it will produce repulsive gravity and therefore balance this cosmical repulsion will balance the attraction due to gravity and we will have a static universe. This was in 1917. So what he did was, this is Einstein's equation as he published it in 1915-16 and he added a constant term lambda in order to produce this cosmic repulsion. We shall see in the later lectures how and why this constant term actually produces a repulsive gravity. Now, we'll wait for a couple of more lectures to discuss that. Five years later, in Moscow in Russia, a young mathematician by name Alexander Friedman <clears throat> studied Einstein's general theory of relativity under the assumption that the universe was homogeneous and isotropic. Certainly, if you look at our universe with very large telescopes, at least telescopes that were available at that time, it seemed like the universe was indeed homogeneous and isotropic. Then Friedman came to the extraordinary conclusion that such a homogeneous and isotropic universe cannot be static within the framework of Einstein's general theory of relativity. It must either expand or it might contract. He didn't say which ought to happen. But he certainly ruled out the possibility of a static universe, which Einstein preferred. Now, as luck would have it, the journal to which Friedman submitted his paper sent this paper to Einstein for refereeing. Einstein, of course, strongly disagreed with Friedman's conclusions and held up the paper for two years. Finally, <clears throat> after a long and persuasive letter from Friedman and intervention by several others, Einstein relented and he requested the journal to go ahead and publish this paper. He admitted that his arguments for holding up this paper were actually wrong. 
Now, let us discuss for a minute homogeneous isotropic spaces. We are now concerned with three-dimensional space. Isotropy everywhere necessarily implies homogeneity. But let's not belabor this point. Let us state it separately as homogeneous isotropic spaces. Three-dimensional homogeneous isotropic space it's a very high degree of symmetry. It has three translational degrees of freedom and three rotational degrees of freedom. This very high symmetry restricts admissible geometry of such spaces to only three possibilities. A, the geometry space must be flat. The three-dimensional space must be flat or Euclidean. B, the three-dimensional space may be a sphere of a constant positive curvature, a three-dimensional sphere. The sphere that we are familiar with, like a football, is a two-dimensional sphere. Its surface is a two-dimensional surface. We are talking about a three-dimensional sphere. If you want to visualize it, you have to go to an imaginary four-dimensional Euclidean space, and there you will see the three-dimensional sphere. And the third possibility, third and only other possibility, is the geometry of space is hyperbolic, and the curvature of space is negative. So these are the only three possibilities that are admissible for a homogeneous isotropic space. This is what mathematics tells you. Based on this, Friedman made a very important discovery. He argued that the metric, the way you measure distances between two points of a homogeneous isotropic universe must be of the form dA squared is equal to c squared dt squared multiplied by what is given in the bracket. And here is a new term, r squared of t. Now this metric was later on independently arrived at by two phys mathematical physicists, Robertson and Walker. So in the literature these days, it is referred to as the Friedman-Robertson-Walker metric. But it was actually Friedman who first stated this metric. Now, there are three possibilities, as I said before. A closed universe corresponds to k equal to 1. k is a curvature constant, is equal to 1. An open universe with negative curvature corresponds to k is equal to minus 1. And a Euclidean universe corresponds to k equal to 0. Now, the important thing to appreciate is that this metric, which was pulled out of the hat, as it were, satisfies Einstein's field equations. In other words, the solution of Einstein's field equation for a homogeneous isotropic space will yield you this metric. Now, let us consider a very large cloud, maybe even infinity, and let us consider a small sphere inside that, whose radius is small r multiplied by capital R of t. So what we are doing is to say that r, which is the co-moving size of the sphere, the sphere may expand or contract. In the co-moving frame, its radius is always small r, but for an external observer, because the radius is increasing or decreasing, you have to multiply it by a function which is the function of time only. Because of homogeneity and isotropy, R cannot depend upon X, Y, or Z. It's a function only of time. Therefore, this balloon or this sphere can either expand or contract. Now, in Newtonian theory, we can write down what should be the equation of conservation of energy. What you have here on the first term of the left-hand side is half <coughs> mv squared, which is the kinetic energy, I'm considering a unit mass, minus the potential energy, gm over r, must be equal to a constant. 
Now this equation can be simplified to read as r dot squared minus 8 pi g by 3 into rho into r squared is a constant where rho is the density of this uh, density of matter and radiation in this universe density of whatever there is energy density now that's what Newtonian theory will tell you so the constant on the right hand side is the total energy now in general relativity this is not the way to write it and that's what Friedman discovered Friedman derived this expression which goes under the name as Friedman equations that r dot square this proportionality r of t satisfies this differential equation where did this thing come from this comes by plugging in the metric that I showed you in the previous slide into Einstein's gravitational field equations. That will give you an equation for this function r of t. r dot squared, where dot refers to dr by dt, minus 8 pi g by 3 into rho, r squared is equal to minus kc squared, where k is the constant which represents the curvature of the three-dimensional space which entered into our metric in the previous slide. Now, this equation is what upset Einstein because what this equation tells you is that in order for r dot to be zero, in order for the universe or this infinite cloud to be static, the density must be zero and the curvature must be zero. So as long as there is matter and radiation in the universe, this function r of t, which I shall now call as the scale factor, this is the factor that tells you how r increases or decreases as a function of time, that time derivative of that scale factor cannot be zero. In other words, the universe cannot be static. It must either expand or contract. That is a rigorous statement that can be made. Now let's try to understand this a little better. Now consider purely a Newtonian theory. Consider an infinite cloud which is homogeneous and isotropic. It has no center. Every point inside the sphere is a center. Now it is very, very easy to show. It will take only about one minute. I leave it as an exercise for you to show that such a cloud has to either expand or contract unless the density is zero. It could be density of matter or density of uh, radiation. So as long as there is energy density, it has to either expand or contract. I will not prove it to you. It's a very simple exercise. I already made that possible to you by looking at this Friedman equation that r dot cannot be zero unless the density is zero. In other words, a stationary universe is ruled out. Now, now as this infinite cloud, which is our model of our universe, let us say expands. It can either expand or contract, but let's consider the case where it is expanding. As it expands, the distance between any two points x1 and x2 will change with time. Let us say that at time, initial time t0, x1 t0 minus x2 t0 was the distance between these two points. Now, this distance will, at a later time t, increase by this factor r of t and the new distance will be x1 of t minus x2 of t. Now, according to which observer is this equation valid? Well, according to every observer in the universe. So every observer in the universe will conclude that they are at the center of the universe because it's an infinite universe. Every point is a center and they will all agree on this statement. Now this factor r of t is known as the scale factor of the universe. So it tells you how distances change with time. Distances increase or decrease 
as as what? As the universe expands or contracts. Now, what does this scale factor go to do with the universe expanding or contracting? Because in general relativity, this scale factor R of t, which entered into our metric, the Friedman, Robertson, Walker metric, is actually the radius of curvature of space. Now you may say, but look, if the universe is closed, if k is greater than zero, then you can talk of a three-dimensional sphere and a radius of curvature of that sphere. But what if the universe is open or had a negative curvature? Well, if, the, if a little thought will tell you that if the universe had a negative curvature, if the geometry of the universe is hyperbolic, then it can still be considered as a sphere with an imaginary radius. That's just a mathematical trick. What about a flat space or a Euclidean space? Well, that is just a limiting case of either a closed universe or an open universe in the limit where the radius of curvature goes to infinity. So please remember that uh, R of t very often is loosely referred to as the radius of the universe or the size of the universe. It is not the radius of the universe. It is not the size of the universe. It is the scale factor of the universe. If you want a geometrical interpretation of the scale factor, then according to general relativity, certainly in a closed isotropic space, it is the radius of curvature of our three-dimensional sphere, which is our space. So if you did go to a four-dimensional imaginary Euclidean space and look at this three-dimensional sphere, then it will be the radius of that sphere. Now consider a two-dimensional example of this. Let's consider a two-dimensional space. Then we are considering a two-dimensional sphere. That is the surface of a balloon or a football. The curvature of a football is everywhere the same. And as the balloon or the football is inflated, the curvature will change because the radius is changing. So as the balloon expands, the distance between any two points on the surface of the balloon will increase. The velocity with which any two points will recede from one another velocity is dr by dt, will be linearly proportional to the distance between the points and the reference points. So here is a plot that I have taken from a book that George Gamow wrote many, many years ago, one of a series of wonderful, wonderful popular books meant for children. This book was called The Creation of the Universe. I still happen to have a copy of it, and this is a figure from his uh, book. So here is a balloon, and he has drawn galaxies, and he has marked one galaxy as V. And as the balloon is expanded, as you blow into the balloon, the distance between any two galaxies will increase. And this rate at which that distance increases will be proportional to the distance between the two galaxies. And that is what is shown here in a modern diagram. So, since all distances will be increased, since all distances will be stretched, including your meter stick, the wavelength of radiation will also be stretched. So the distance between two crests of a wave or two troughs of a wave will also be increased. And that is the phenomenon of redshift, which we shall come to presently. Now let's go to America from Europe, where Vesto Slipher, whose name we had encountered before, who discovered the rotation of galaxies, in the same set of observations in 1912, Slipher discovered that the spectral lines from galaxies, well-known identifiable spectral lines, say the H-alpha line of hydrogen, were systematically shifted to longer wavelength. They were red shifted. Now, this attracted the attention of a Catholic priest in Belgium by name Georges Lemaitre. He was a mathematician and he had studied Einstein's general theory of relativity very carefully. He was a student at the time. 
and he was a Catholic priest. In 1927, two years before Hubble published his very famous paper, in which he is supposed to have discovered the expansion of the universe, Jean Lemaitre suggested that the recession of galaxies discovered by Schliffer might actually represent a universal expansion, in other words, the expansion of the universe as a whole. Now, what does the expansion of the universe actually mean? Well, George Lemaitre answered this question using Friedman's paper. George Lemaitre was the first person to propose the theory of the expansion of the universe, often wrongly attributed to Edwin Hubble. So please remember that John Friedman said the universe cannot be static, it has to either expand or contract. Now Lemaitre noticed Schliffer's observation, which showed that the distant galaxies were moving away from us because the wavelength is shifted to the red. And he derived what is now known as Hubble's law, namely the velocity of recession is directly proportional to the distance between the two galaxies. All this he said two years before Hubble's paper. So he wrote a paper in which he showed that the scale factor R satisfies this equation. R dot is proportional to R, namely the, the rate of change of distance between any two points is proportional to the distance between the points itself. And the constant of proportionality is what we today call Hubble's constant and we call, we given it the name H in honor of Hubble. So the Hubble constant is R dot divided by R, where R is the scale factor of the universe, which represents the radius of curvature of the three-dimensional space. And this linear relation between R dot and R, or velocity and distance, is known as Hubble's law. Lemaitre argued, based on general relativity, that if the universe itself is expanding, then the redshift of the wavelength of spectral lines discovered by Schliffer should not be interpreted as Doppler effect. Remember, Doppler, I mean, uh, Schliffer interpreted this redshift as galaxies moving away from us, as a recession of galaxies. Lemaitre said, no, 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 this is wrong. You should not interpret this redshift as Doppler shift. He said you must interpret the redshift according to general relativity. General relativity tells you that all distances will increase with time. And that increase is proportional to the scale factor R. Therefore, if lambda observed is the wavelength of radiation observed by us today, and if lambda emitted is the wavelength when it was emitted, then this ratio is the scale factor of the universe, the time we are observing, divided by the scale factor of the universe when the light was emitted, where R is the scale factor of the universe. So this is an exact relation that follows from general relativity. This was first pointed out by Lemaitre in his paper. So as the universe expands, all distant scales increase the waves get stretched. This is known as the cosmological redshift. It is not Doppler shift. This is known as cosmological redshift. The stretching of the wavelength is because the universe as a whole, space itself, is expanding. But Lemaitre also went on to show in this paper that for small redshifts, if delta lambda over lambda is very small, then that general relativistic formula that I wrote down here reduces to the familiar Doppler formula, namely delta lambda over lambda is equal to V over C. But if the redshift is large, then one should not use the Doppler formula, not even the special relativistic version of the Doppler formula. 
Now you may say, according to this formula, redshift can never exceed one because v is always less than c. But that's not the full relativistic formula for Doppler effect. I derived for you what the relativistic formula for Doppler effect is. It is square root of v plus c divided by v minus c, which can exceed one. There is no difficulty whatever without v exceeding c. But you should not use Doppler formula. You must interpret large redshifts in terms of cosmological redshift. Because redshift is large, means distances are large. That means there's a lot of mass between you and the uh, galaxy. And therefore, gravity uh, influences light propagation according to general theory of relativity. Therefore, you must interpret redshift as cosmological redshift, stretching of space and not Doppler effect. Now, Hubble, in 1923, as we discussed, using Henrietta Leavitt's Cepheid variables, discovered, measured the distance to the Andromeda Nebula, as 3 million light years. Then he measured distances to other galaxies using a new distance scale, which, which was then available. Based on that, Hubble and his collaborator, Homerson, wrote a very famous paper in 1929, in which they suggested that if you plot the velocity of the galaxies, redshifts are now interpreted as Doppler shifts, and redshifts are translated to velocities, and that velocity you plot on the y-axis, and distance along the x-axis, he found these black dots. And he suggested that maybe you should draw a straight line through this. Now, if, I, if you were my student in a laboratory and insisted that this is a straight line, V is equal to some constant times R, I would be very skeptical. But that's what sheer genius is. It, it is an instinct that Hubble had that this must be a linear relationship. He did not, he did not know anything about Lamatt's paper. He did not know anything about Hubble's law as a direct consequence of general relativity. Now, this was in 1929. Many years later, around 2000, using a telescope named after him, the Hubble Space Telescope, here is the data. Once again, this is velocity in the y-axis. Distance, now the distance is not a mere 7 million light years, which is all that Hubble had access to. This is 70 million light years. Well, this is certainly beginning to look more like a straight line, doesn't it? Well, today, you can go from 7 million light years to 2,000 million light years using type 1 supernovae, which we discussed a few weeks years ago. And there you see a beautiful linear relationship. This is Hubble's law. The velocity of recession of clusters of galaxies is linearly proportional to their distances, and the constant of proportionality is known as Hubble constant. So Hubble remarked that the clusters of galaxies are everywhere running away from us as though there was plague on Earth. They're all running away from us. Now, upon learning of Hubble's result, Einstein acknowledged his mistake and called his artificially modifying his beautiful theory of relativity by introducing a constant in order to make the universe static. He called it the greatest blunder of my life. Well, was it a blunder? Wait and watch. Now let's pursue this story of this expanding universe. <clears throat> How fast is the universe expanding now? Second is, what is the age of the universe now? Well, let's consider the present expansion rate. Hubble's law of expansion says that the velocity of recession is equal to h times r. H is called as the Hubble's constant. It is not a constant in time. It will change with time. 
but it is the same everywhere in the universe. So it's a constant as a function of space and not as a function of time. I'll tell you in a minute why it cannot be the same as a function of time. Now, the reciprocal of H as units of time. That is clear from this. This is distance divided by time. And this is distance. Therefore, the reciprocal of H will be time, units of time. So you can say the Hubble constant measures the expansion rate of the universe. And the reciprocal of the Hubble constant is a measure of the age of the universe. Now the expansion rate will of course depend on the age of the universe because the Hubble constant is not a constant in time. Why? Because when the universe was small, gravity was stronger. Therefore, as the universe tried to expand, the decelerating influence of gravity would have been stronger. Therefore, the expansion rate would have been smaller. Whereas, uh, sorry, the expansion, initially the expansion rate is very large after the Big Bang. Then, <clears throat> gravity is trying to pull it back. Since gravity will tend to pull the universe together, the expansion rate should decrease with time. So, the universe must decelerate as it expands due to self-gravity. This is why the Hubble constant will change with time. What is the value of the Hubble constant today? Well, this was one of the most controversial and acrimonious debate in the history of astronomy. People derived values of the Hubble constant which would make the universe much younger than the Earth, maybe as old as your grandmother. That simply meant there were huge errors in the measurement. Finally, that question is settled at the level of 8% or 10% accuracy. We can now say with great confidence that the present day value of the Hubble constant, which is the expansion rate of the universe, is 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Remember, the unit of Hubble constant is reciprocal of time. So, this is 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And that's what I've tried to indicate there. So if this is the cluster of galaxies in which we live in, if there is another cluster of galaxies which is a million light years away, then it is expanding at a speed of 200 kilometers per second. And another cluster of galaxies which is twice far away is expanding at a speed of 400 kilometers per second. Here I've said kilometers per second, and this is light years, and here it is megaparsec. That is why 70 has become 200. So remember, it is 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec to an accuracy of 8 or 10 percent. We can say this, and we can believe in this with considerable confidence. The age of the universe, reciprocal of that, will be roughly 13 billion years old. Depending on who you ask, it will be 13 billion years old or 14 billion years old. But that's the level of accuracy with which you can assert. Well, we shouldn't really say that is the age of the universe. More precisely, there was a big bang 13 billion years ago when the present expansion began. So it is the duration for which the expansion has been going on. Now, did the universe exist before the Big Bang, before the expansion began? Well, we do not know. And we will come to this discussion a couple of lectures from now. So let's go back to Friedman's equation for the scale factor capital R of T. This comes straight from Einstein's field equations using the metric that is appropriate for a homogeneous isotropic space. At early times, we can neglect this curvature factor k, and you will get a relation. r dot squared divided by r squared will be 8 pi g rho by 3. So this can be used to define a critical density. The critical density is 1 
where k is 0. k is 0 means curvature of space is 0. That means space is Euclidean. Sum of the three angles of triangle is 180 degrees. The surface area of a two-dimensional sphere is 4 pi r squared, and so on. Now, what this tells you is that if the density of the universe is equal to the critical density, which is 3h squared divided by 8 pi g, where h is the expansion rate of the universe, then the geometry of the universe must be Euclidean. Why? Because if I put k is equal to 0, then it tells me that the density of the universe must be equal to this critical density. We will have a lot to say about this critical density uh, two lectures from now. But so let's now leave it at that. What I wanted to point out was that the geometry of the universe critically depends upon the density of matter and radiation in the universe. And the dividing line is the density is equal to the critical density, which is given over there. So what general relativity tells you about the universe is that the universe could be either this or this or this. What is plotted in the y-axis of all these three plots is the scale factor of the universe or the radius of curvature of space. And what is plotted on the x-axis is time, of course. Now, if k is minus 1, is negative curvature, the universe is unbound, it's hyperbolic, and the density rho is less than the critical density, which, is, which I defined in the previous slide. If k is plus 1, then the curvature of space is positive, and space is a three-dimensional sphere, it's a bound universe, and the density of the universe is greater than the critical density. But if the density of the universe is precisely equal to the critical density, then k is equal to zero, the universe is still unbound, but the universe is flat. Geometry is Euclidean. All right? These are the three, only three possibilities in general relativity. Now, in the next lecture, I'll tell you what observations tell us about what is actually the geometry of the universe. To let you in, observe, from observations, we, can con we have concluded that the universe is in fact Euclidean. Space is actually flat and Euclidean. That the curvature is zero and the density of energy density of the universe is precisely equal to the critical energy density which follows from Friedman's equation. Now we'll switch gears and go forward. We'll discuss the thermal history of the universe. Let us consider the early universe where things were in equilibrium. I call this the equilibrium era. According to all models of the universe, the universe must have been smaller and smaller in the distant past that you saw from all those three diagrams. The scale factor would have been very small, tending to zero or t equal to zero, whatever that might mean. Now, as long as kT, the thermal energy, is much greater than 2 mc squared, particles and antiparticle pairs will be created spontaneously. Electrons and positrons, neutrons and antineutrons, protons and antiprotons, and so on. Neutrinos and antineutrinos. Now, these particles and antiparticles will also annihilate, producing radiation. Therefore, matter and radiation will be in thermodynamic equilibrium, and they will have the same temperature T. That is the meaning of thermal equilibrium. Now, there is a very special temperature in our discussion, and that is temperature when the universe was hotter than 10 to the power 10 Kelvin. Now, when the temperature was greater than 10 to the power 10 Kelvin, electron-positron pairs can be produced spontaneously, and electrons and positrons and neutrinos will be in equilibrium with one another. Because, Photons can 
decay to electrons and positrons, electrons and positrons can interact with neutrinos and so on. Therefore, for equilibrium, what you need is the collision, what you need for equilibrium are collisions between all species of particles. And there must be enough collisions. What is enough? It means that the rate of collisions, that the time scale of collisions must be much rate, reciprocal of the time, must be much greater than the expansion rate of the universe. In other words, before the universe can say double in size, there must be many, 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 many collisions that must be possible. Stated mathematically, if lambda is the collision rate between species of particles, these collision rates may differ from particles to particles. Collision rate between neutrons and protons is different from electrons and neutrinos. But that's where the theoretical physics comes in. Whatever it is, let's give them all a name lambda. If that collision rate is much larger than the expansion rate of the universe, which is the Hubble constant, then these particles and radiation will be in thermodynamic equilibrium at a constant temperature. So the key thing, which I'll come to again and again and again, are the reaction rates faster than the expansion rate. So please remember that. This is different from laboratory experiments, but the laboratory is not expanding. There the universe is expanding. As the universe expands, collisions become less probable. That's why you have to compare the collision rate with the expansion rate of the universe itself. So in the equilibrium era, temperature in excess of 10 to the power 10 Kelvin, particles will be in thermal equilibrium as long as the reaction rates between them are greater than the expansion rate of the universe. Now in that epoch, the baryon density, please remember, that if baryons and antibaryons are equal in number, then they will annihilate, then there are no baryons. Similarly, if leptons and antileptons annihilate one another, electrons and positrons, neutrinos and antineutrinos, there will be no particles there, no net number of particles there. But we know in our universe there are protons, there are neutrons, there are electrons, there are positrons. Why there is an asymmetry why there are more particles than antiparticles is a mystery which we still haven't solved. So something was different in the very early universe. There have been conjectures about that. We will come to that in a later lecture. So all I'm saying is, so when I say baryon density, what I really mean, the number of baryons minus the number of antibaryons, that must be very much less than the number of photons. Similarly, the number density of leptons minus the number density of anti-leptons would be very much smaller than the number density of photons. Now, one can deduce from Friedman equations, it's a rather simple thing to deduce, that the temperature of the universe must be inversely proportional to 1 over the square root of the age of the universe. But T is some time measured from some fiducial point which we shall call as the beginning of the universe for the moment. Now, if I put in the proportionality constant, this is what is the formula that you would find in textbooks on cosmology. T is approximately one second multiplied by temperature divided by 10 to the power 10 Kelvin to the power minus two. Therefore, you see temperature, Therefore, 10 to the power 10 Kelvin becomes a very crucial number. That's why I've written it over there. Now, here are some actual time intervals for you. The universe will cool from 10 to the power 12 Kelvin to 10 to the power 11 Kelvin in just 0 0.0098 seconds, 0 0.01 second, a hundredth of a second. And it will cool from 10 to the power 11 Kelvin to 10 to the power 10 Kelvin in just one second. So the universe is expanding very rapidly and it's cooling very, very rapidly. Now, when the temperature reaches this magical value of 10 to the power 10 Kelvin, neutrinos say goodbye, I'll see you later. Why? 
because at that temperature the collision rate between neutrinos and electrons and positrons became less than the expansion rate of the universe therefore neutrinos could no longer be in thermal equilibrium with photons electrons positrons neutrons and protons so the neutrinos said goodbye and well let's let's let me stress this point once again take this reaction rate for example electrons per positron go to neutrinos plus anti neutrino now that reaction rate is given by gamma for neutrino gamma nu for neutrino so what i'm saying is that what theory tells you what general relativity tells you is that gamma nu by h which is the expansion rate of the universe is t by 10 to the power 10 whole cube therefore 10 to the power 10 kelvin at 10 to the power 10 kelvin gamma becomes equal to h and when the temperature <laughs> drops a little bit below that the equilibrium is totally lost therefore at the temp when the temperature drops below 10 to the power 10 kelvin neutrinos decouple from the rest of the universe and they go their own way so the temperature of the neutrinos was initially the same as the temperature of matter it would have been 10 to the power 10 kelvin before the 10 to the power 11 kelvin and so on now it has decoupled so the neutrinos are expanding their energy density is decreasing and therefore the temperature will also decrease and the temperature will decrease just as the temperature of black body radiation will decrease as one over the scale factor of the universe and you can calculate that today those neutrinos will still remain as black body radiation but uh, will have a temperature of about 2 kelvin so the universe today is filled with neutrinos primordial neutrinos as it is filled with photons as we shall discuss in the next lecture which is the cosmic microwave background radiation so just as there is a cosmic microwave background radiation there is a cosmic neutrino background and the temperature of that is about 2 kelvin whether or not someday we'll be able to detect this neutrino background is an open question so to repeat again at the temperature at 10 to the power 10 kelvin electrons positrons photons neutrons and protons still remained in mutual thermodynamic equilibrium but neutrinos evolved differently neutrinos decoupled now let us change the topic let's go back to august 1920 and let us recall what eddington said let me read it out for you to my mind the existence of helium is the best evidence we could desire of the possibility of the formation of helium the four protons and two neutrons constitute constitute its nucleus must have been assembled at some time and place and why not in the stars when they were assembled the surplus energy must have been released providing a prolific supply of heat prima facie this suggests that the interior of a star has a likely locality since undoubtedly a prolific source of heat is there in operation i am aware that many critics consider the conditions in the stars not sufficiently extreme to bring about the transmutation the stars are not hot enough they say the critics lay themselves open to the obvious retort well tell them to go and find a hotter place this is what eddington said in 1920 20 years later george gamow a brilliant russian theoretical physicist was the first person to appreciate the significance of George Lemaitre's papers of 1927. He knew what Eddington's hotter place was. The hotter place was the early universe. So in 1940, George Gamow advanced the idea that the elements 
were synthesized in the early universe, when the universe was hot and dense. So this was George Gamow's theory of cosmological nucleosynthesis. Now this idea was pursued by Gamow and his two illustrious collaborators, Alpha and Herman, and they published a series of papers on cosmological nucleosynthesis. And this was done later on by more people in a more sophisticated manner, but I'm going to tell you this story rather briefly. So what happened, according to Landa, I mean, according to George Gamow, was the following. When the universe was very young, protons and neutrons combined to form deuterium. Then deuterium and deuterium combined to form tritium, or emitting a proton. Or deuterium and deuterium combined to form helium-3, emitting a neutron. So the key thing to appreciate is that protons and neutrons combine to form deuterium, and then deuterium combines to form tritium and helium-3. Once you have that, you're home. Deuterium nucleus can combine with tritium nucleus to form helium-4, or deuterium nucleus can combine with helium-3 to form helium-4. In this case, a neutron is emitted. In this case, a proton is emitted. So this is the basic reaction for nucleosynthesis. The first step is combining neutrons and protons to form deuterium. That is the first and crucial step. Before we can calculate the abundances, one has to know what fraction of baryons were neutrons and what fraction were protons. Both are changing with time. And that's where the complexity is. And that's where the beauty of theoretical physics is. Both fractions change with time. Now, at a temperature in excess of 10 to the power 10 Kelvin, the ratio of baryons to photons, eta, the number density of baryons or the number density of photons, was a very small number. As I said, photons outnumber 5 times 10 to the power minus 10. What is it today? Today it is 6.7 times 10 to the power minus 10. So you'll say, why, doesn't, why, doesn't this, why hasn't this number changed? Well, for a very simple reason. Both the baryon density, number of baryons per unit volume, and the number of photons per unit volume decreases 1 over r cube. Therefore, this ratio will never change. So the ratio was fixed in the very early universe and continues to be the same. Now, when the temperature was just before neutrinos decoupled, when the temperature was 3 times 10 to the power 10 Kelvin, neutrons and protons remain in equilibrium through weak interaction processes. The neutrinos were still coupled, so weak interaction was very much uh, effective. For example, all these reactions were taking place. Neutron plus neutrino goes to proton plus electron. Neutron plus pro positron goes to proton plus antineutrino. And a neutron, of course, decays according to beta decays, proton plus electron plus antineutrino, something that we are very familiar with. Please remember the very fact that proton does not decay to neutron, but neutron decays to proton tells us that the mass of the neutron, the rest mass of the neutron, is greater than the rest mass of the proton, and the difference in mass is 1.293 million electron volt. So the Q is 1.3 million electron volt, and that's a very important number. So using the theory of Salam, Weinberg, and Glashow, the electroweak unified theory, one can calculate this reaction rate, the rate at which neutrons are converted to protons, and the rate at which protons are converted to neutrons through all these reactions, which now involve also neutrinos, but neutrinos are very much in equilibrium because you are at a temperature in excess of 3 times 10 to the power 10 Kelvin. Now, that ratio of number of fraction of neutrons is given by a very simple differential equation. 
Let's try to understand them. Xn is the fraction of baryons which is neutrons. Therefore, the num fraction which is protons, Xp, is 1 minus Xn. So Xn plus Xp is equal to 1. Xn is a fraction. Xn is number of neutrons divided by number of neutrons plus protons. And that follows, that is given by this very simple differential equation. Let's look at the right hand side. Xn is the fraction of neutrons. And neutrons are being converted to protons at this rate. And there is a negative, negative sign because neutrons are being lost. They are being converted to protons. But then there is a second term. Where the, the second term has Xp, the fraction which is protons. The fraction which is protons is simply 1 minus the fraction which is neutrons. And lambda proton to neutrons. So protons are being converted to neutrons. So neutrons are being added. Therefore, the second term as a plus sign, the first term as a minus sign. So it's a very simple first order differential equation. You simply solve it. You know what is the ratio, what is the, what fraction is neutrons, and then immediately you know what fraction is proton. So you can now combine neutrons and protons and say how much deuterium there must be, how much helium-3 there must be, how much helium-4 there must be. But how do you integrate this equation? To integrate a differential equation, you must have some initial value what was it at t equal to 0 or t very early times? Well, that is easy to answer because when the temperature was in excess of 3 times 10 to the power 10 Kelvin, neutrons and protons were in equilibrium because neutrinos were also in equilibrium. And all these reactions in the yellow box keep neutrons and protons in thermodynamic equilibrium. Well, if they are in thermodynamic equilibrium, then the reaction rates going one way and the other way must be given by the Boltzmann factor e to the power minus energy difference divided by kT. Energy difference is simply the mass difference multiplied by c squared. Here, I've written it in unit where c is set equal to 1. Or in more familiar language, the fraction of neutrons divided by the fraction of protons is given by e to the power minus the mass difference between neutron and proton divided by kT. Remember, this comes simply from Boltzmann statistic. If I have an energy level 1 and energy level 2, the ratio of population N2 divided by N1 must be e to the power minus bracket E2 minus E1 divided by kT. That's all I'm saying. So this is the thermal equilibrium ratio of neutrons to protons. So, so when the universe was about one second old and the temperature was in excess of 3 times 10 to the power 10 Kelvin, I have this value of neutron-proton ratio and that gives me the initial condition to integrate this equation. Now, the ratio of neutron to proton is given by e to the power minus q over kt. Now this can be simplified because the ratio which is protons is 1 minus xn. A very simple algebra will give you, take few seconds, tells you that the fraction which are neutron is 1 divided by 1 plus e to the power plus q over kt. You work it out. It's, it's very elementary. All I'm saying is I wanted to integrate this differential equation and tabulate column 1 fraction of neutral time, column 2, fraction which are neutrons, column 3, fraction which are protons. That's all I need. At any given time, I want to know how many, what fraction were neutron, what fraction were proton. I needed an initial value to integrate that equation, and that gives me the initial value. So, when the temperature drops to about 10 to the power 10 Kelvin, neutrinos have decoupled, and the rate of conversion to neutron to protons and protons to neutrons becomes less than the expansion rate of the universe. So this 10 to the power 10 Kelvin, which is the temperature at which neutrinos decouple, is also a very crucial time for the neutron-proton history. Because at that time, the rate of conversion to neutrons to protons and protons to neutrons, suddenly that rate becomes less than the expansion rate of the universe, meaning 
these reactions will no longer take place. The neutrinos aren't there, therefore the reaction doesn't take place. But this reaction will always take place. If I just put a neutron on a tabletop, given a thousand seconds, it will decay to proton, electron, and an antineutrino. What is the average lifetime of a neutron? It's about a thousand seconds, 885.7 seconds, if you are interested in the exact number. Therefore, if all other possibilities are ruled out now, or proton cannot convert itself to neutron because it is less massive, all that can happen is that neutrons will decay in number according to radioactive decay, e to the power minus t over tau, where tau is about a thousand seconds. So I can now plot, I can now make a table. I can form, formulate a table in which I can write as a function of time. What is the fraction of neutrons? What is the fraction of protons? So at any given time, I can say how much neutrons I can make, how much of helium I can make, how much of helium-4 I can make, and so on. But although protons and neutrons can combine to form deuterons, and I know how many protons and how many neutrons there are, please remember that the neutrons will also break up in collisions. So you have to wait till the temperature of the universe drops below the binding energy of the deuterium nucleus. The deuterium nucleus consists of one proton and one neutron with a potential energy, attractive potential energy of interaction E. That E corresponds to some T, KT, and that T, you must wait for that T to be attained. And that T is 0 0.7, 10 to the power 9 Kelvin. This we know from laboratory experiments. How much energy do you need to break up a deuterium nucleus in collision? That much energy you need, multiplied by Boltzmann's constant. So when the temperature of the universe dropped to 0 0.7 times 10 to the power 9 Kelvin, the which is the binding energy of deuterium, Neutrons and protons combine to deuterium, and deuterium combine to form tritium and helium-3, and then helium and tritium, helium-3 and tritium combine to form helium-4, which is the most tightly bound of the lighter nucleus. So all the helium-4 that we observe today in the universe was formed when the temperature of the universe was 0 0.7 into 10 to the power 9 Kelvin, there was a small amount of deuterium left behind, small amount of tritium left behind. And if you look at the reaction rates carefully, a tiny little bit of lithium-7 is also left behind. Okay? So, you have formed deuterium, you have formed tritium, you have formed lithium-7, and you have formed helium-4. But what about heavier elements than uh, helium-4? What about elements with atomic ma ma number 5, atomic number 6, atomic number 7, 8? After all, if you have helium-4, I can capture a proton and form an element with atomic number 5, and so on. Why? This is not possible because there is no stable element with atomic weight 5 or atomic weight 8. If I combine helium-4 with one proton or one neutron, I get an element with atomic weight 5. Such an element doesn't exist. If I combine two helium-4, I get an atomic weight of 8. That element doesn't exist. Well, but these elements certainly exist on Earth is there in the periodic table. So how are they formed? Well, they were formed by very, very clever processes, which I will tell you about. Let's not worry about it right now. All I can say is that those processes cannot take place when the universe was at that temperature because the universe is constantly expanding and it's expanding very, very rapidly. A star is not expanding. Therefore, certain very, very clever thing that can happen in a star 
could not happen because the universe was expanding. Therefore, the cosmological nucleosynthesis was stopped, was terminated when helium-4 was synthesized. Now, one of the books that George Gamow wrote was called Mr. Tompkins in Wonderland. I used to have that book as a kid. These books are all reprinted now. You can buy them. Wonderful, wonderful book. I remember now, 60 years ago, I must have been 10 years old, uh, 70 years ago, 10 years ago, 10 years old. I remember still this picture. Mr. Tomkin is running in the road and plotted on the road is the periodic table of elements. And he's trying to jump over from element number four to element number eight. In between, there is a gap in the periodic table. George Gamow was trying to explain in simple terms how in stars this gap in the periodic table was actually overcome. So all, I'll come to that story in a few minutes now, but right now I want you to remember that the cosmological nucleosynthesis that George Gamow was talking about terminated when helium-4 was synthesized. That's it. And when did this happen? It happened when the temperature of the universe was 0 0.7 times 10 to the power 9 Kelvin. And I know from general relativity exactly when that happened. That happened when the universe was 168 seconds or three minutes old. That's why the title of the famous best-selling book by Steven Weinberg, The First Three Minutes. So all the deuterium and helium-4 in the universe was synthesized when the universe was 168 seconds old and the temperature was 10 to the power 9 Kelvin. At this time, the reaction rate going from deuterium to helium, tritium and helium-3 equals the expansion rate of the universe no more um, tritium and helium-3 was produced, and therefore no more helium-4 could be produced. And the fraction of helium-4 by weight that was produced in the first three minutes is 0 0.27. This is the fraction by weight, by mass, okay? I can also give you the fraction by number, but this is fraction by weight. All right, so here is the plot. Now, what is plotted on the y-axis is the elemental abundance relative to hydrogen. And what is plotted on the x-axis is the ratio of the number density of baryons divided by the number density of photons, Nb divided by N gamma, which I said is of the order of 5 times 10 to the power minus 10. There are 10, 10 to the power 10 times more photons than baryons. Now, what you see, this plot is helium-4, this plot is deuterium, this plot is lithium-7. All these things you see are functions of the baryon to photon ratio. So, uh, what are you going to conclude for this? Well, we know what the baryon to photon ratio was then, because what, we know what it is now, and that ratio doesn't change. And that is the vertical red line that I have drawn over there. So, that's what primordial nucleosynthesis predicts is the fraction abundance of helium relative to hydrogen, abundance of deuterium relative to hydrogen, abundance of lithium-7 relative to hydrogen. Now why does these fractions abundances vary with this ratio? It's because larger the number of baryons per unit volume, Higher the temperature, the nucleosynthesis could have begun earlier, and therefore the time for the neutron to decay was much less. Or put it in very simple terms, when the number of baryons is larger per unit volume, the collisions between baryons is more effective, and therefore the nucleosynthesis is more effective, which is why larger the ratio <coughs> well, th that's why higher helium-4 abundance is. that is why helium-4 abundance increases not very dramatically but over here it is increasing dramatically anyway this is the value which I have circled 
is the value that is predicted according to the value of baryon to photon ratio today, which is the same that was there at three minutes when the universe was three minutes old. That is helium-4. This is what theory, first principles calculations tell you. Well, the ultimate orbiter is experiment. What do observations tell us? Well, observationally, well, helium, of course, is synthesized in stars, but helium is then destroyed in the stars because helium is converted to carbon and so on, right? So all the helium-4 is primordial in origin. So what you try to look is, you look for compact galaxies which are metal poor. That means the stars in these galaxies have not synthesized heavy elements. That means they are very low mass stars and they are compact galaxies. And what you do is in ionized hydrogen regions surrounding the stars, which are called H2 regions, you try to measure the abundance of helium-4 spectroscopically. And what observations give us is 0 0.2477, which corresponds in the plot that I showed you to baryon to photon ratio of about 6 times 10 to the power of minus 10, which is pretty close to the value that you derive from the cosmic microwave background radiation. So what I'm trying to say is that the observationally what we find as the abundance by weight of helium-4 agrees excellently well with what is predicted by pure first principles calculation. Now, so both Eddington and Gamma were correct. Stars do produce deuterium and helium, but they are destroyed subsequently to synthesize heavier elements. All the deuterium and helium are primordial in origin. Since deuterium is easily destroyed, any measurement of deuterium, any measurement of deuterium gives you a lower limit to the deuterium abundance, therefore upper limit to the baryon density. So if you measure any deuterium, that is, so you must say the deuterium abundance in the universe is at least this much, if not more. Now, can we try to get a handle on a reasonably accurate measurement of deuterium? Well, we can, by looking at absorption lines of hydrogen and deuterium in the spectrum of quasars. Now, we have found quasars at very large redshifts when the universe was very, very young. The light from the quasar is absorbed by intervening intergalactic hydrogen clouds in which there is hydrogen and deuterium, so you measure the absorption lines, just as we did 21 centimeter absorption line. And that gives you a value of two point, uh, deuterium to hydrogen ratio, you get is 2.78 and to the power minus 5. So these are all in very good agreement with, so, so that horizontal blue line, which you may or may not be able to see, that intersection gives me the deuterium abundance, and that agrees very well with the theoretical calculation, which I have put as a small red circle. So all is well. So in the remaining few minutes, let me quickly discuss how are the heavier elements synthesized? If they weren't synthesized when the universe was three minutes old, how were they synthesized? Well, here, there are all these elements. Up to iron, elements were synthesized by stars. But then this is the periodic table elements with their abundances. You have to account for them. Well, let me repeat them. Hydrogen, of course, is primordial. Deuterium, helium-3, helium-4, and lithium-7 were synthesized when the universe was about three minutes old. The absence of stable nucleus with A equal to 5 and A equal to 8 broke the primordial synthesis beyond helium-4. Now, we do know there is lithium-6, beryllium-9, beryllium-10. We understand that these are produced in interstellar space when heavier elements are bombarded by cosmic rays and heavier elements are broken up. And in this spallation, spallation of heavy nuclei, these elements are produced. So let's forget about them. Let's go back to the stars. 
How do stars produce carbon-12? Well, if helium-4 plus helium-4 will give me beryllium-8, beryllium-8 is not a stable element, how do I produce carbon? Well, this is how. It was pointed out in 1952 by Edwin Saltpeter that helium-4 and helium-4 can combine to form beryllium-8, but this beryllium-8 is unstable. It is in an excited state. Given enough time, it will decay back to 2 helium-4. But if in that very, very short time for which beryllium-8 is alive, if it absorbs another helium-4, then I will have carbon-12. And what Hoyle pointed out in 1952 in a brilliant, brilliant paper is that this carbon-12 will be in an excited state. That is because when you have the sum of the energies of beryllium-8 and helium-4, that energy exceeds the energy of the ground state of carbon-12. So carbon-12 that is born is in an excited state. It's in a resonant excited state. And then it decays to carbon-12. So this is how this blockage at A equal to 5 to A equal to 8 is overcome in stars by what is known as a triple alpha reaction, alpha particles or helium-4 nuclei. 1, 2, and 3. This is known as a triple alpha reaction. So, carbon-12 is produced by triple-alpha reaction. Carbon-12 can then absorb a helium-4 and produce oxygen-16. This is how stars produce oxygen-16. Now, you may say, why can't carbon-12 combine with another carbon-12 and produce magnesium-24? Very simple, right? Why go through all these complicated procedures? You directly form magnesium-24. But it doesn't happen. What happens is, Carbon-12 combines with carbon-12, produces neon-20. And the extra four particles are emitted as an alpha particle. Why? Why doesn't this blue thing doesn't happen? Why this yellow thing happens? That's because when two carbon-12 nuclei combine, it forms what is known as a compound nucleus. That compound nucleus is in an excited state. So that compound nucleus has to decay from excited state to the ground state. It can do so by one of two ways. It can decay by emitting a gamma ray, in which case carbon-12 plus carbon-12 will produce magnesium-24. Or the excited state of this compound nucleus can decay by emitting an alpha particle producing neon-20. Now here is the thing, the reaction rate for carbon, I mean, this compound nucleus to jump from the excited state to the ground state via strong interactions, nuclear interaction, that time scale is very much shorter than the decay due to electromagnetic interaction where gamma rays are emitted. That is why this is not preferred and this is preferred. And then you go on from there and synthesize elements all the way up to iron 56. There's the nickel and cobalt in that iron peak element. So that's where nuclear synthesis stops because that is where uh, exothermic reactions stop. Then how, are you, how to produce elements heavier than iron? There, gold, platinum, uranium, bismuth, and so on. How do you produce them? They are produced by what is called neutron capture. But before that, here is a familiar Cassiopeia A supernova remnant. And here is the X-ray spectrum in the Chandra Observatory. There you see the elements synthesized in the stars, oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, sulfur, argon, calcium, iron, and so on. But you don't see very much evidence of elements heavier than iron. But according to theory, these elements are produced by neutron capture. Now, when a nucleus has to capture protons, because protons have a positive charge, and nucleus has a positive charge, there is a Coulomb barrier. 
and then you have to go through this complicated quantum mechanical tunneling and so on. But neutrons have no charge, so they can just go big into the nucleus. Therefore, there is no Coulomb barrier. But a nucleus cannot absorb an arbitrary number of neutrons because the number of neutrons would like to be equal roughly to the number of protons. This is what we find in the periodic table. Therefore, a nucleus that will form by absorbing a neutron will be unstable against beta decay. That neutron will decay to a proton emitting an electron and an antineutrino. So you won't get very far. Now, therefore, this process of neutron capture can be divided into two regimes. One is a slow capture process. What I mean by slow capture process is the following. If the flux of free neutrons is very, very low, then each capture results in a heavier element, but then that heavier element decays due to beta decay before the next neutron is captured. Therefore, you don't get very far. Well, you do, you can produce elements up to bismuth 209, that's as far as you can go, but you can't produce uranium, thorium, um, and so on. Cannot be produced. So those are produced and what is known as rapid neutron capture process. In other words, if the flux of neutrons is very high, when will the flux of neutrons be very high? When the core of a massive star, the iron white dwarf collapses to form a neutron star, there's a lot of free neutrons. And when the flux of neutrons is very high, then multiple neutron capture can happen very quickly before radioactive decay through beta decay occurs. So you can build the heavier element. But what you need are seed nuclei. But then we have, there's a lot of iron peak elements present at the time of the supernova explosion. Therefore, for a long time, theoretical physics, astrophysicists thought that Elements heavier than iron are produced in supernova explosions by rapid neutron capture processes. So core collapse supernova was considered as a favorite candidate for producing these heavier elements. But actual calculations had great difficulty in producing elements such as gold, platinum, europium, uranium, thorium, and so on. So that was another scenario that was suggested a long time ago. In 1974, David Schramm, who tragically died in a small plane that he was flying soon after this paper was written, well, and his student Latimer at the time, Latimer was a student at the time, made an extraordinary suggestion, terribly ingenious suggestion, that lots of neutrons will be around when a black hole tidally rips apart a neutron star as the black hole neutron star binary coalesce. Now, in 1974, nobody was talking about a neutron star, neutron star binary, or a neutron star black hole binary. But he said, suppose there is a binary with a black hole and a neutron star, and then the neutron star comes very close, it will be tidally ripped apart by the black hole, and there will be a lot of uh, uh, free neutrons, and then you could synthesize the element. Interestingly, that very same year, the Hulse-Taylor binary pulsar was discovered. And one knew immediately that these two binary pulsar neutron stars will finally coalesce, shrink due to gravitational radiation, and finally coalesce. And they did coalesce on August 17, 2017, producing a burst of gravitational radiation, emitting a burst of gamma rays. We talked about this in an earlier lecture. Now, here is the point. After the burst of gravitational waves and after the burst of gamma rays had subsided, there was an afterglow in the visible wavelength and later on in the radio wavelength. Now, in the visible radiation, how is the visible radiation produced in any supernova explosion? By radioactive decay of iron peak elements. But in this case, they found radioactive decay, spectral lines which corresponded to radioactive decay of R process element, rapid neutron capture process. Now, 
what about gold and platinum unfortunately the spectral lines of gold and platinum in radioactive decay lie in the ultraviolet region of the spectrum hard to detect but the spectral lines of europium are in the visible region and what is interesting is that they were seen by astronomers for the very first time in a supernova explosion which corresponded to the coalescence of two neutron stars people found spectral lines of europium etc et almost certainly gold and platinum must have been there if they had observed with a good ultraviolet telescope but people did estimate that in that coalescence of two neutron stars that happened 10 earth masses of gold was produced a lot of gold 10 earth masses of gold was produced so let me summarize this very rapid fire discussion of nucleosynthesis deuterium helium and lithium were produced when the universe was 3 minutes old story ends there heavier elements up to iron peak were produced in massive stars elements heavier than iron were produced in neutron capture both in slow neutron capture and in rapid neutron capture the supernova explosion by core collapse of massive star is an excellent scenario another possible scenario which is far more convincing is that elements such as gold platinum uranium thorium europium etc were synthesized by the merger of neutron stars we have certainly seen one instance of this and i'm sure many more will follow very very soon so with that we shall conclude our very brief discussion of cosmological nucleosynthesis and nucleosynthesis in general in the scenario of the expanding universe and in the next lecture we shall continue with this story where where we left the story the universe was 3 minutes old and the temperature was 10 to the power 9 kelvin it was just a primordial soup of photons helium 4 leftover neutrons and protons electrons positrons today we have galaxies clusters of galaxies and structures such as this how did the universe evolve from a primordial soup how did these structures evolve that's what we shall discuss in the next lecture till then thank you very much